What is community? Bearing one another's burdens is the topic for today. Bearing one another's burdens. Just to go over with you again what community is. Uh, fellowship with others based in care and value for one another and potentially a commonality. So this is a, there is a binding factor within a community or one another care for each other and build each other up. And, and there's a closeness there, uh, a, a unity in community. That's the, the last part of community is unity. Bearing one another's burdens is a biblical element of community, and Jesus doesn't just want it, he expects it from all of his followers. <clears throat> so you might be wondering, what does it mean to bear someone else's burden? What does that even look like, uh, to bear someone else's burden? Because uh, you know, we have service, we have uh, kindness, we have comforting. There's all these, these other words that are out there that we need in community. And, and some of those fit into this bearing someone else's burden. And we'll get into that a little bit more today. But to give you a proper illustration of what it means to bear someone else's burden, let's take a look at... Uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23 to 26. This is, the, this is as Jesus is carrying the cross, he comes to a point where he can't carry the cross anymore. The soldiers see this. And so now as the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. So, so this is what it looks like to, to bear a burden. Uh, Simon from Cyrene, he is, uh, Cyrene is, a, is a, a place in Africa, and we don't know if Simon is visiting from Africa, if he's from, if he actually is, uh, uh, living now somewhere around Jerusalem. There's a lot of uh, mystery to Simon, uh, but we do know that he has, uh, he is connected with the church somehow because in the Gospel of Mark, the account that's in there, you, they, they make note of his two sons. Uh, one of his sons who is mentioned in, uh, in, the, in the world of the early church. So, so he's connected somehow. But, but here, in this particular passage, you see that, um, that Simon of, of Cyrene uh, had been taken by the soldiers and he was forced to put the cross on him and carry it the rest of the way for Jesus. Je the, 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 it's, it doesn't specify exactly why the Roman soldiers forced uh, Simon to do this. Uh, it could be that Jesus was, uh, like it was an act of compassion where they saw that Jesus was really struggling and they, they, they had somebody else carry it the rest of the way, but Roman soldiers tend not to be really compassionate. That, that's not their, um, <laughs> that's not their shtick uh, in, in the Bible or, you know, most of the time, and so the, it's it's likely that they saw that Jesus was probably uh, either one going to die before he made it to the cross, and they wanted to make sure that he suffered the um, the edict that was given by Pilate that he was crucified. They wanted to make sure that that happened, and so they had kept him alive by having somebody else carry the cross, um, or. He, it, it was going too slow for them, and they were growing impatient, and so they had Simon carry it. But one way or another, here you have Simon having to take the burden of carrying a, a huge wood cross uh, up, up, a, up a hill, up a mount. And, um, and, and so, uh, you know, he probably did not want to be involved in this at all. 
And so, and he certainly wasn't looking forward to carrying this thing. And so they forced him to do it. What bearing a burden means from looking at this, it means getting involved in someone else's mess. Uh, Simon did not want to get involved. He had to be forced to be involved, but involved he was. So it means getting involved in someone else's mess. It means uh, relieving or removing someone else's problem. In this case, it was carrying the cross. And so it relieved Jesus, removed the, the problem. You know, whether or not that was so that Jesus could suffer even more on the cross uh, than, than dying with, with carrying the cross is, is neither here nor there. For that moment, at that time, him carrying the cross relieved or remove Jesus's problem. And it required personal sacrifice. Uh, Simon had to sacrifice. It was risky, you know, being in that environment and doing that. And he risked himself, uh, you know, his, his, his personal comfort, and he had to carry that cross. So that's what carrying a burden for someone else looks like. And we're going to, we're going to, um, look at a number of stories from scripture and passages from scripture regarding bearing burdens. But bearing burdens uh, is not just a New Testament concept. Uh, God, um, here in, in Deuteronomy 10, 18, it says, he defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. So, here you have God's, this is uh, the Israelites getting ready to enter into the land uh, that they had been promised for many, many, many years. They had been in the wilderness for, for 40 years, and God is preparing them to enter the land. And as they go to enter the land, God is laying out certain uh, precepts for them. So he, <clears throat> he says, he defends the cause of the fatherless. And these are the people, these are burdens. People who don't have a father, uh, uh, widows who don't have a man uh, to care or provide for them in ways that they need help. There, and then there's the foreigner who is coming into a strange place and doesn't necessarily have anything, uh, doesn't have shelter, doesn't know uh, how to get food. And so there's hospitality that needs to be shown to the foreigner and care for the foreigner. And so God in Deuteronomy 10, 18 says that um, those bur these people of burden are going to be cared for. Their burden will be carried. And God even legislates uh, regularly held events forcing the Israelites to bear the burden for the fatherless, the widow, and the foreigner. He implements the Feast of Weeks. Uh, than the Feast of Booths and other observances. In these cases, uh, God demands the first fruits of the Israelites' crops. And the Israelites were not, were, their, their main vocation was not farming uh, when they were in Egypt. They did some, uh, but their, their, main, their, their main job was shepherding and caring for flocks and other labor. And so here you have uh, God giving some regulations. You know, you're gonna have these feasts, these celebrations where you're gonna be remembering where you came from and how heavy a burden that you had. And with the first fruits that you bear, you're gonna offer them to me. And in that offering of the first fruits, those first fruits are gonna go to the, uh, the Levites and the priests, they're going to go to the, uh, the fatherless, the widow, and the foreigner with the first fruits. So with the first fruits, they are to bear the, the burden of those who are burdened. Now we get to the story of Ruth, also in the Old Testament. Uh, this is before David. Uh, she's actually David's... Uh, great grandmother or great great grandmother in the story of Ruth um, Naomi uh, 
wonderful woman loses her. Uh, there is a famine and she moved to Moab, a, a land outside of the promised land, not Israel. And uh, it's a foreign land where there, there was apparently food at the time, but uh, her husband end up, ended up dying and she had two sons who married Orpah and Ruth. And then her two sons ended up dying and, and widowed the, uh, Ruth and Orpah. And Naomi, things were not going well for her in Moab at all. And so she was planning on moving back to Israel. And, and she said to Orpah and Ruth, go back to your families. Just go back to, to where you came from and be with them and you'll have a promising life. I'm sure you'll find somebody else to maybe even marry you. Um, and you'll be provided for, you'll be cared for. Just go back and take care of yourselves and leave me be. And, and what ends up happening is Orpah goes back to her family, but Ruth does not. And that's where uh, you have the, the famous uh, verses in Ruth 1. In Ruth 1, um, 16 to, to 18, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, uh, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you from me. When Naomi realized Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So Ruth took it upon herself, a foreign woman, to bear the burden of her mother-in-law, who was, was suffering and um, didn't have anything, and, and, uh, and, and God only knows what was going to happen to her. Bear the burden so much that she was going to take on everything about her mother-in-law, including her God. And so they get back to Israel, and and um, Naomi directs Ruth to go to a field to glean food from it, a particular field owned by Boaz, who is related in a way to Naomi. Um, but uh, here we, we have Ruth going to glean the field, and Boaz says to Ruth, now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? That means not to throw her off the field or punish her for, for being there. And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face bowing to the ground, and she said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes, that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? This is a big deal. Uh, Boaz is bearing somewhat of a burden for Ruth right now, and Ruth is there to bear a burden for Naomi, who she's going to be bringing food home for as well. And so he goes on, but Boaz answered her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me and how you left your father and your mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. This is really cool because Boaz uh, knows that, that Ruth has borne the burden, bear the, bore the burden of Naomi and and, and Ruth is a blessing in his eyes. And moreover, I just wanted to point out the last part, had, rings, uh, rings that uh, Abrahamic uh, uh, leaving everything to go to an unknown land. So Ruth kind of does this Abrahamic type thing where she leaves the land that she knows to go to a land that she doesn't know and has that faith that everything is going to work out and that she's doing the right thing.
Then he says, the Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. So what, what can we take from Ruth with regards to bearing uh, someone's burden, bearing one another's burden? One, had she uh, had her own burden, she lost her husband and she needed to put the pieces together, back together, but she decided to bear her mother-in-law's burden. So even though she had burden, she took on her mother-in-law's burden. And, and that's how it is with most of us. We have burdens. All of us have burdens. And we need to decide, are we going to take on someone else's burden in addition? So she had her own burden, yet she took on the burden of someone else. Two, God looked upon her with favor for what she had done and for her faith in taking on that burden. Abraham, that just rings uh, of Abraham. And she received relief from her burdens through Boaz, who was a man of God. So even though she was bearing someone else's burden, Boaz came and bore some of her burden. And eventually she ends up marrying Boaz, who really then relieves this burden. So this is a really good um, analogy, or not analogy, but story about bearing one another's burdens, Ruth bearing Naomi's burdens, and then Boaz bearing Ruth's burdens. So let's move on to the parable of the Good Samaritan. The par parable of the Good Samaritan. We're moving to the New Testament now. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. This is really interesting because um, in other accounts of Jesus mentioning the uh, what's called the Shema, um, which th this is uh, what Jews are doing every single day when they get up and they pray the, the Shema. And so uh, he, Jesus doesn't answer, you know, what is the greatest commandment? And then Jesus answers. Jesus has this man answer and, and share this, the command, the Shema. So just something interesting in this account. All right, Diane. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hand of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Ooh. So here is another great example. I mean, Jesus is talking about, um, has the man recite uh, 
the Shema and and not not just the hero Israel, uh, the Lord your God, the Lord the Lord is one, and then love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength, but the um, love your neighbor as yourself part, uh, the second greatest commandment. And so, uh, and then the example he gives for this um, and for who a neighbor is, a you being a neighbor to somebody else, um, he gives the example of this, the parable of the Good Samaritan. So let's take a look at what this is telling us about uh, bearing one another's burdens. Bearing burdens is tied to Shema. That's, I mean, it's, this passage uh, shows that connection, that if you are living out the greatest commandment, uh, the Shema of Jesus, you are going to bear others' burdens. That's what you need to do to live this out. And, and he says this Shema is what leads to eternal life in this, in this story. Next, uh, religious law, customs, and traditions and programs should never come before bearing in others' burdens. The, the priest and the Levite all passed by this man on the road who was beaten up by robbers and laying there, possibly dead, because of the law. They would potentially be unclean if they came over and, and dealt with him in some sort of a way. They put the, the, uh, the traditions and the law and what they believe before bearing someone else's burden. And Jesus is saying here that the bearing of someone else's burdens should come first. So that's why he had those pass by him. And, um, and here you have a Samaritan come and bear the other's burdens, the burdens of this man. And uh, Jesus commands you to do what the Samaritan did. He says, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. He, uh, he doesn't suggest it. He, he commands it. Go and do likewise. What kind of um, things did the, let's go back for a moment. What kind of things did the uh, Good Samaritan do to bear the burden of this man? Uh, well, one, he took pity on him. He actually had compassion. Two, he went to him and bandaged his wounds. There was physical burden bearing, like health burden bearing going on there. He put the man on his donkey. So physically, he took him um, to an inn and he gave him shelter. He, the, the next day, he, gave, uh, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said to look after him. So he provided financially. He bore a financial burden. So uh, really good illustration of what it looks like to bear burdens uh, given right from Jesus' mouth. Let's take a look at Galatians. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted to carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. So what is this saying about bearing one another's burdens. What is the Apostle Paul saying here? Some things you can pull out of here are, you should treat those whose burdens you are bearing with gentleness, with gentleness. 
Um, if you look at Simon of Cyrene, he was forced to carry Jesus' burden. And, you know, that's a separate thing. He, he wasn't necessarily under uh, the, the, um, the commands of Jesus at the time. He m might not have been a disciple or anything, but he was asked to do that. And so he was forced to do it. But when you go to someone uh, to bear their burden, you, are to, you should do it with gentleness. You shouldn't do it with annoyance. You shouldn't be abrasive. Fine, I'll, 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 uh, you know, I'll do this. You know, you're supposed to approach that person with gentleness, with gentleness. Uh, temptation is a burden. Things that tempt us are a burden, and so um, it's good for us to help one another. To, to bear certain burdens, if you notice and know that, that someone is tempted by a particular thing uh, into, in, th that would cause them to sin. So helping people who you know are tempted by certain things and preventing them from falling into that particular sin. And carrying each other's burden fulfills the law of Christ. So that, that goes back to uh, the Shema, the, the greatest commandments. To love the Lord your God completely and to love your neighbor as yourself. We look at that to love your neighbor as yourself. When you are bearing a heavy burden, when you're carrying a heavy burden, something is weighing you down, and maybe it's becoming difficult to live at that point. It, you, are, you are coming to a breaking point, like maybe Jesus carrying the cross on the, the Via Della Rosa. Um, when you're coming that, to that breaking point, you would want someone to come there and help bear that burden with you, to, to relieve you so you can catch your breath so you can be restored in some kind of way and, and then move forward with them. There's a, an uh, interesting illustration of heaven uh, where, <laughs> now, now this isn't, I might have mentioned this to some of you before, but this, this isn't like an actual, this is what heaven looks like picture, but it's an illustration to give you an idea, um, have an illustration of heaven and hell. And they, the illustration of hell is they march all these people into a room, okay, a big feast room, and and there's there's this wonderful, delicious soup on the table and food on everybody's plate, and everyone is chained together and chained at the elbow, so you can't so you can't bend your elbow at all, just straight out, and so people are picking up food and trying to feed themselves with this delicious food and they can't get it in their mouth and it's like torture. And the, the image of heaven is the same banquet room, everybody chained at the elbow and, and in chains, the same situation where you stick your fork or your spoon into the food and, and you're trying, except you're not trying to feed yourself. In the heaven illustration, everyone is feeding each other instead of trying to feed themselves, which they can't do, but they can feed each other. So that is just an interesting illustration of bearing burdens, uh, caring for one another in selflessness, where others take care of you and you are taking care of others. Here's a list of some various burdens um, that you might find uh, that are out there. And this is not an exhaustive list by any means because burdens take on all different forms, things that weigh, weigh people down. You have temptation is a burden. Sin is a burden. Economic burden, food, clothes, uh, rent, car, bills, mortgage, home repairs, etc. 
and you have health being a burden. And right now, it's a huge, <laughs> health is an enormous burden that's, uh, uh, you know, take crippled the, the entire world pretty much. Um, but people will have specific health burdens. Maybe they're confined to a wheelchair. Maybe uh, someone needs to go for dialysis in the hospital. Um, there, there's all kinds of health burdens that, that you can put underneath here. And to have somebody help bear those burdens with you is enormously precious and helpful. Uh, emotional burdens, loss of a loved one, uh, other, other things that you might be going through, trauma that you've experienced in life. Um, you know, I don't necessarily want to put under their uh, uh, ad addiction, but addiction is another burden that you can put on this list that I haven't put on here. Um, environmental burdens um, that, that could consist of a number of different things. Uh, the, it could be people who are affected by weather. It could be the, uh, the area that you're living in, the house that you're living in, um, the people that you uh, work with. Well, that, that can go under employment too, but uh, just, just the environment that surrounds you each and every day can weigh on you. And, and so that could be a burden. Social justice burdens. Uh, you can be uh, a victim of, of injustice in our country. I mean, injustice is rampant all around the world, and it, the United States is not exempt for that. Um, and we're working on that. And, and I think that that is something that needs to be continuously worked on. You have the prison system that if you looked into what's going on in the prison systems, you would be shocked. I was shocked when I looked into, when I heard some of the things that were going on there. Uh, civil rights issues, education, all kinds of social justice issues, incarceration. People who are incarcerated are feeling an enormous burden. Uh, being in a, can you even imagine being in a jail cell your whole life, uh, maybe even not having access to a window, um, having uh, no freedoms, not being able to just hop in a car and go see your kids or your parents. Uh, it's, it's a huge burden <clears throat> to be incarcerated. And these are people who have been convicted of crimes, who have done wrong, uh, but at the same time, these are still people. And Jesus came to forgive sins and uh, told us to love one another, bear one another's burdens. And in, uh, in Matthew, uh, in 20, I believe 25, when he talks about the goats, the sheep and the goats, um, he says, uh, whoever goes and visits you in prison, has you've done the same for me. So, uh, so a number of these come from, from that uh, sheep and the goats. Incarceration, uh, I just mentioned. Employment and identity. Identity is a, a burden for a lot of people. Who am I in this world? Who am I in my family? And then you have the whole other added thing of sexual identity, um, which is an enormous burden and, and has been a burden. It is a burden for a number of people in this country. <clears throat> Let's move on to acts. Acts. Uh, another illustration of bearing one another's burdens in the church as part of the church. I want to get uh, uh, someone to volunteer to read. Actually, not a volunteer. I'll pick somebody to read this. Um, let's see here. Is Trish Simpson available? Acts 4, 32 through 35. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For, far, for from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. 
Okay. Thank you, Trish. I just want to highlight a few things uh, that are in here. The believers were in one heart and mind, and that heart and mind was the Shema, loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all your strength, and um, loving your neighbor as yourself. That was the one in heart and mind. And no one claimed any of their possessions was their own. They shared everything they had. How interesting. God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. <laughs> That's incredible. And then you have people from time to time selling their, their homes. I, I want to I mention some, this passage, uh, I think, sticks in some people's crawls uh, when they look at Acts because this can look like it has a, uh, a communist, socialist element to it. And we are all uh, red-blooded Americans. Uh, and so th when we hear socialism, communism, that automatically gets us stirred up. And I, wanna, I just want to comfort you that, that this is not about communism or socialism. Uh, and I'll point, point, out the, point this out to you. There is no government system that is forcing the disciples to do this. There's, there's no ramifications if you do not participate where the, the government's going to throw you in jail. They're not forcing anything upon anybody. Something else to note is that uh, everybody is not given, that does not have equal possessions as they would in uh, communism and, or socialism where you have everybody has to have equal everything except for those who are running the system and then they are uh, they could have basically what they want and, and pillage but <clears throat> but in this system it seems like everybody has different amounts there's needy people and then there's people who have all these properties and houses so even in this context where everything is kind of being shared and and there's no needy there are people who have more, probably earning more. And then there's people who are struggling as well. So everybody is not even an equal. Uh, so j just to keep in mind as we're looking at this, is not some sort of uh, socialist, communist uh, propaganda thing, okay? So we need to find what is God telling us about bearing one another's burdens within the context of the church and looking at this and, and God's commands. What is God telling us through this passage about bearing one another's burdens? Because it is very clear here that burdens are being bore. First, you need to understand that you and your resources are not yours. Nobody, even though some had more than others, nobody looked at their resources as being theirs. They own it. I own it. I am mine. So everybody saw themselves. They saw all that they had as not being their own, but belonging to God. That is really important as, as far as how you look at everything that you have and everything that you do and everything that you are, that you are not your own. Second, bearing one another's burdens is a sign that God's grace is powerfully at work within you. If you are bearing others' burdens, God's grace is powerfully at work within you. And as a community, Bearing one another's burdens, that is a light that shines to everybody, that God's grace is powerfully at work in each person and in the community. And then bearing burdens does not always mean being hands-on with a person, but you can use someone trustworthy as a conduit. In this situation, uh, people, uh, other believers would sell a property or a house, and then they would take that money and give it to the apostles who would then distribute it properly. So 
they didn't just take the money and hand it to a person directly. Um, they might not even have known who the needy people were. So they gave them to the apostles. The apostles knew who was needy, knew who was burdened, knew who needed that relief, and they provided the relief from those burdens. And finally, I want to look at this. Jesus bore your burden. We have a God and a Savior who has bore your burden. And so it is incredibly important, the, the matter of bearing one another's burdens, when our Lord, our Savior, is a God who bears burdens himself. And if we are going to look like him, if we are going to be like him, we need to bear one another's burdens. So let's take a look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 22 to 24. Peter speaking about Jesus here. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. So unlike Simon of Cyrene, who was forced to carry the cross of Jesus, Jesus carried the cross voluntarily, willingly, and, and bore the burdens of the world, of you and of me. I want to take a look at, at what this, uh, this passage uh, is talking about with regards to bearing burden. A burden is a problem that someone cannot handle on their own or has difficulty handling on their own. See, uh, when we look at ourselves and the burden of sin, we couldn't handle the burden of sin on our own. We can't handle the burden of sin on our own. Um, and so we needed somebody else to help us. We didn't know who that was, you know, before Jesus came. But after Jesus has come, we understand that he is the only one who could bear those burdens. And he does it. God didn't abandon us. He sent Jesus to come and bear that immense burden. And so when we relieve somebody else of their burden, uh, their burden is something that they, that they cannot handle on their own or that they have difficulty handling on their own. Next, Jesus was the only one who had the capital. He was, as in this passage, completely sinless, completely truthful, completely humble, completely obedient to God. So he is the only one who had the capital to bear your burden of sin for you. There's nobody else who had it. It was only Jesus. And he did it. He saw that, he knew it, and he did it. He bore it. And then the last thing that we see from this with regards to bearing burdens, there is no limit as to how far you should go to bear one another's burdens because Jesus himself gave it all. He gave everything. He, he didn't say, I'll give you this much, or I'll give you this much. He bore it all, and he did it in obedience to God. God wanted him to do it, and I'm sure Jesus wanted to do it himself, but he was obedient to God, and, and, uh, and, and he, <laughs> he definitely didn't, was looking forward or to the suffering and the pain and the punishment that he endured, but he did it, and he did it willingly. 
He didn't curse anybody while he did it. Um, he, he didn't threaten them. He just went like a lamb to the slaughter. So just to go through again, uh, briefly, what we looked at as far as what bearing burdens mean. Getting involved in someone else's mess. It means getting involved. A lot of times we just don't want to get involved. Um, we don't want to get someone else's mess on us, but it means getting involved in someone else's mess. It means relieving or removing someone else's problem. It means personal sacrifice. It means um, bearing someone else's burden, even though we ourselves are burdened. It means God looking upon us with favor for bearing one another's burden. There's blessing that's there. God's looking at us with favor when we do bear others' burdens. It means that we, we will receive relief from our burdens through God and through others that God puts in our lives. Bearing burdens is tied to the law of Jesus. It's, it's tied to the Shema. Uh, religious law, customs and traditions and programs should never come before bearing one another's burdens. Jesus commands you, do, commands you to do what the Good Samaritan did. He said, go and do likewise. He commands us to do this. You should treat those whose burden you are bearing with gentleness, not hotly or, or, or uh, irritated or, or mean, uh, but you're supposed to treat them with gentleness so that they, in their, in their being relieved, still believe that they themselves have value. Temptation is a burden. Carrying each other's burdens fulfills the law of Christ. You need to understand that you and your resources are not yours, but you are God's and your stuff is God's. Bearing one another's burdens is a sign of God's grace powerfully at work in you. Bear bearing burdens does not always mean being hands-on with a person, but you can use someone who is trustworthy as a conduit. A burden is a problem someone cannot handle on their own or has difficulty handling on their own. Jesus was the only one who had the capital, completely, who was completely sinless, completely truthful, completely humble, completely obedient to God, to bear the burden of sin for you. And there is no limit as to how far you should go to bear one another's burdens because your Lord and Savior gave it all. <clears throat> Lastly, I wanted to point out to you the picture that I had up. Um, some of you may have seen this who have been to Israel, but this is on the Via Della Rosa. Um, this, is the, um, this is the trail that Jesus walked with the cross. Um, and right here in this particular spot, uh, this is talking about right here, the, uh, this is where Simon of Cyrene carried Jesus' cross, or where it's supposed to be in the stations uh, where he carried the cross. I thought it was appropriate, and we're talking about burdens. Does anybody have any uh, questions or anything to add to this lesson? I see Jim with his hand yeah. up. Yeah, it's not really a question so much as uh, when you noted about dealing with uh, taking on others' burdens with gentleness didn't really speak about it, but isn't it also appropriate with humility, not being boastful of, wow, look what I'm doing for somebody, but just do it. Absolutely, 100%. Really glad that you added that in there. Uh, the example of Jesus, completely humble. Um, and, and so we follow that act of humility, that it's all for him and his glory. Uh, what you have done for these people, you've done for me. And Jim, I'm really glad that you mentioned that. Drake. 
Let me add in here, uh, Julian. I appreciate a, a very uh, solid uh, biblical discussion about uh, uh, looking after the needs of others. Uh, that does dovetail in very well with last week's uh, uh, Sunday school about imitating uh, Jesus, uh, where we uh, that that is a trait uh, of his to to look after the weak. Um, let's just turn it around uh, for a moment, though. Um, there are some really big needs in this world uh, that we all can't meet. Um, one third of the world not knowing Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Uh, we can pray for it, uh, and indeed we should. Uh, uh, encourage evangelism, uh, but individually we can't meet that need. Many living below the uh, about a uh, dollar fifty a, a day in places around the world, we just can't meet all these needs. I'm wondering if you could turn it around uh, just for a moment and just uh, uh, say something about uh, uh, limits. About limits? Yeah. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> no. And that's sort of the other side of the coin. Coin here is one as one gives and one should give. Um, uh, there's no limit. When I said there's no limit because Jesus gave it all, <clears throat> Jesus was being obedient to God. God told him what God the Father told him what he was to give, and so he gave it all. So under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, under the guidance of God, is uh, where you figure out how much or how little you should give in any particular situation as far as bearing burdens, and especially when we're talking financially, because um, you can really put yourself completely at a disadvantage and, uh, and, and in some situations. But uh, the important thing is that you are obedient to God and his direction and leading in as to how much you are to bear another burden or you are to give for someone else um, financially or or otherwise because it, you know we, like you said drake we there's there's immense burden all over the world <clears throat> and so uh we could give everything that we have period sell everything that we have and and still um this the problem may persist it will persist. Um, and so uh, you need to be wise and following the guidance of Jesus, of the Holy Spirit, as to and being in tune with him through scripture, through prayer, um, as to what you should do. And he will, he will lead you. If you are uh, in, in his will, um, if you are uh, honoring him, uh, he, the Holy Spirit will guide you. You will know. And, and he uses uh, um, he uses other people. He uses uh, your conscience uh, uh, to to help guide decisions. In that same in that same vein, um, to what Drake was talking about, and also what you were <clears throat> mentioning earlier, Julie. Uh, you, if you the case, and I may be blurring a couple of the, of the uh, verses together into one, but the situation where uh, the woman was uh, putting the oil on on for Jesus, and he, he was. The others were criticizing, saying, "We could take that uh, jar and sell it, and give the money to the poor." And part of Jesus's response is longer: "Was the poor will always be with us?" Yes. And uh, when, and her act was an act of kindness <clears throat> for him at that time. Also, to relate to what you were talking about for not being socialism or communism, if you look at the order that, uh, or the command when it had to do with the, uh, a couple of people were assigned to handing out uh, goods or relief uh, to widows and orphans, this is part of the problem between the, uh, some of the, the Gentile Christians were feeling slighted by the Hebrew uh, Christians, as far as resources, the order for treating for the widows was for widows who did not were like over forty or fifty. I forget what it was who could not marry or um, didn't have sons or whatever to take care. It wasn't unilateral. So even with that type of thing, there's a sort of aspect of it's not automatic. And again, it's coming out of the heart. 
So there's a couple different things that you put together when you're looking at terms of uh, burden. But the oils, I think, is the poor will always be amongst us. So like like you were saying, you, there's no way that you, we as people, can give away enough to solve it. Our solution is through God. Thank you, Bill. I couldn't help but think as you were going through the lesson how this puts into context the second point of Central's mission right after loving God, we serve others. And so it, uh, you know, I, I think it's so very appropriate to have that as one of the three major components of our mission at our church. This was really helpful in that regard. In the Jewish tradition, one of the most important ways you can help someone is to help them get a good education and find a good job. That's a, a very high priority for them. And uh, in many mission opportunities, they give ways to, you know, like give somebody a cow or, or give them fishing equipment or and to enable them to carry on long term. And I think that's, that's, and, 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 and for me, one of the most important things you can do is to give people a good spiritual foundation so they're stable enough to hold, to, to support themselves and care for themselves without, without a lot of the instability that comes from a shaky religious foundation. Hey, that's that's absolutely right. <clears throat> um, kind of like uh, if I, if I give you a fish, you eat for today. If I teach you how to fish, you eat every day. <laughs> right. That's, that sort of thing. And so there's more to it than just uh, you know just charity and a handout. You want to help relieve people's burden by lifting them up. 